He's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what's about to come. What do you do with... What do you do... With the drunken sailor? What do you say you do? What do you know why? How do you know it? What do you know it? Hi, how do you know it? I know I'm not seeing you. Uh, I don't, I know, but I tried. Thank you, everyone, um, for coming along uh, today and also for using the space, you know, a reminder of, of that the space is designed uh, to encourage artists and the audience to mingle as, as, as a unit and, and, and share stories and ask questions. And, you know, so it's really nice to see everybody using the space. Um, um, it's sort of a slightly surreal moment for me, um, seeing Carol Phillips talk to my daughter on stage. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the, the two speakers coming up, actually, um, Carol and Titi Michelle Kopamasi, are, 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 are very literally the, the reason that I, I decided that I'd, I'd try writing. Um, I've always written and I've always read a lot, but um, I never realised that the type of books that I, I loved, I never realised that they were sort of, they were for me until I... I read the work of, of Carol Phillips and Titi Michelle Kopamasi. Carol Phillips's European Tribe, especially, um, such a formative text for me. Um, and then, obviously, an African in Greenland. Um, it was this. It was a situation where, where the black gaze was, um, well, a gaze rather than being looked at, uh, and and it was suddenly normalised rather than otherised, uh, which was. Um, very powerful to me uh, as a young man. Um, Carol Phillips is somebody that I consider to be a, a scribe of the liminal world. He um, grew up working class and black in Leeds on the one hand, attended Oxford, one of the world's most prestigious universities, on the other, where uh, astonishingly he merged with his Yorkshire accent and humour intact and uh, later made it was later made an honorary fellow of the Queen's College. He was born in the small island of St. Kitts, raised in the slightly larger island of Great Britain, and now lives in the United States, where he serves as professor of English at Yale University. Uh, Carol's influences and thematic leanings are intimately linked with that knowledge embedded in the spaces in and between Africa, America, the Caribbean and Europe that Paul Gilroy popularised as the Black Atlantic. Though for the most part, Carol's work resists boxes and has covered themes that have grappled with everything from the legacy of the British Empire to soul music, football and in his new work, an imaginative biography of Jean Rhys, the author of Wide Sargasso Sea. And whilst his restrained, lucid and elegant prose is always present, what defines much of Carroll's literary fiction is less the author and more the nuanced, unpredictable, sometimes contradictory characters that emerge in stories that have seen him as a recipient of the, recipient of the Martin Luther King Memorial Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship and the James Tate, Memori uh, James Tate Black Memorial Prize, amongst many other accolades. Uh, as somebody who's served as something of a, a mentor for me. Carol is, to me, defined by his quiet generosity, his wry sense of humour and sage wisdom that has helped me navigate my way through a literary world that can at times feel as though it speaks a, a foreign language to a, to a black working-class writer. There's the constant feeling 
uh, among such circles that I'm on the verge of letting myself down. Uh, and indeed, I have many times in Carol's presence. Uh, every time I've met Carol uh, amongst academics and literary high society, I've managed to embarrass myself. Um, the first time we met was in Liège and the, the table was invited to tell jokes and the only one I could think of was one that a Liverpudlian woman I'd met in Paris had recently told me. And in the mouth of a little Liverpudlian woman in Paris, it, had seemed, it hadn't seemed an incredibly offensive and sexist joke. Uh, and in my mouth, it really did. Uh, the table went silent and Carol quickly rescued me with an elegant put down when everybody else was too embarrassed to say anything. Uh, another time was when we were in Preston for a weekend dedicated to the Bronte sisters. Carol's novel, The Lost Child, reimagines uh, the character of Heathcliff. We were all due to go on a trip to Haworth where the Bronte sisters famously grew up at least famously for some people, uh, when I uh, asked why there was a field trip to this place, uh, the whole weekend was orchestrated around, another table of scholars went quiet again. Carol looked at me and, and, and said, oh, for F sake. <laughs> and this is exactly what my mates back home in Sheffield would say to me when I was being an idiot. Uh, and again, I felt saved by Carol's understanding of where, very clumsily, I was coming from. And, and he, he's constantly guided me gently to where I really would like to go. Um, he's, uh, he's perhaps the only person who is from this unique position of, uh, of, of being from the north and has traveled this sort of, of has trailblazed the trajectory that I, I really want to try and follow in. Um, but he isn't perfect. He openly admits that he supports Leeds United. And there are so few eminent black writers to have emerged out of Yorkshire that as a Sheffielder I've had to latch onto him and learn to forgive and forget this serious flaw in his character. And uh, I suggest you try too by welcoming Carol Phillips in a tale that links to a player that would never ever sign for Leeds. Carol Phillips, everybody. Um, thank you. This, you. You don't need any guidance. You've organized a terrific um, get-together in Brussels for everybody. You have a book coming out in June. You're busy and prolific. Um, you know, I'm as proud of you as I can be of anybody, so you don't need any guidance. Um, The piece that I'm, I feel like Usher, you know, somebody holding this, but I'll try, I'll try and get through with it, but I'm a bit older than him. Um, it's probably a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> um, the, I'm going to read for about 25 minutes a piece that um, seemed appropriate that I wrote recently. 500 years ago was the founding of the, get the ghetto in Venice, the Jewish ghetto, and, and that was in 1516. And the 500th anniversary of the ghetto was in 2016, obviously. Um, the city of Venice, a friend of mine, um, in the city of Venice invited a number of writers to come to Venice in 2014 to muse and think about uh, writing something in response to this um, quite significant anniversary. So, of course, I said, yes, uh, you know, they want to give you an apartment on the Grand Canal and you just stay there for a month it seemed like a reasonable deal to me. Um, of course, the problem is that you leave and you've had a great time and then you've got to write something. And it took me a while because I couldn't think of what to write um, uh, until 
2017, which, as the arithmetically uh, inclined amongst you will realize, is after the 500th anniversary. <laughs> but anyhow, um, I did eventually think of something to write. So the, the piece was called, I saw Mario Balotelli in the ghetto. Now, most people in this room probably know that Mario Balotelli is an Italian footballer of Ghanaian origin. Uh, perhaps people don't know is that he was adopted by an uh, Italian Jewish family. And there's a very famous photograph of Mario Balotelli when the Italian team were playing Poland um, and they all visited Auschwitz. And there's a photograph of the team wandering around in their Italian tracksuits and Balotelli sitting on the tracks the train tracks, uh, somewhat iconic train tracks that led into the camp, looking very disturbed. Um, so I began to think about this photograph, um, as, as Johnny said, you know, being a, uh, like Johnny himself, a, a sports fan, um, I began to feel that maybe there's some resonance in this photograph that would give me a way to fulfill my obligation to write a piece. Um, and that's, that's the background to the piece. Now, the, the, the only other question is, is it fiction or is it non-fiction? And increasingly, as I enter my, um, a, along with, and I'm gonna rope him in on this, whether he likes it or not, along with Linton, as we enter our dotage, um, boundaries become blurred between genre and I don't know um, I don't know so much anymore about fiction or non-fiction uh, so I saw Mario Bellatelli in the ghetto the low table sat between us Across the other side, I could see that my modest host was cold. He pulled the shawl even tighter around his hunched shoulders. And then he looked at me and he smiled with the peaceful aspect of a devout man. The fire roared, but it had not yet warmed up the small book-lined room. Outside, somewhere in the distance, a bell began to peal with the low, ominous tones, but the man continued to gaze at my person as though he'd not heard a sound. A young fellow then entered the room, bearing a tray, and he placed two small cups of coffee on the table before hers. He'd entered noiselessly, and I watched as he left in the same manner. Please, said my host, you must drink. On a night such as this, it's important that you avoid catching a chill. Without taking my eyes from my host, I picked up the cup and I drank the bitter, slightly granular coffee and I emptied the tiny vessel in two sips. I tried not to rattle the china as I replaced the cup in the circle of the saucer, but suddenly I felt self-consciously greedy and wished I'd not done this as a serene, I wished I'd done as a serene man was now doing and simply held the cup in order that I might warm my hands. Many visitors, he said, lose their way in our city. My host's gentle voice hung in the air and I watched him put down his untouched coffee. He continued. He said, sometimes I wonder if these tourists arrive here with the express purpose of becoming disorientated, as though it's impossible for them to claim an authentic experience of Venice unless they return to their homelands armed with a melodramatic story of panic but having discovered themselves unable to find their way back to their lodgings, he laughed quietly to himself. 
Mario leaned forward. He said, my friend is from England, but he lives in the United States of America. His home is in New York City. I see, said my host. He looked quizzically at me and he said, is that so? Mario was perched on the arm of the sofa on which I was sitting, but now he saw an opportunity to be part of this conversation. You know, said Mario, in New York City, people never get lost. Over there, they have a system where all the streets and the avenues have a number. Moving around is so simple that even a child can find its way from one place to another without any problems. Mario spoke quickly and with confidence. He'd already told me that at least, on at least half a dozen occasions he'd traveled to the United States either to play football or simply to take a holiday. And as a result, he'd seen New York many times and he regarded himself as something of an expert on the subject. They don't, he said, have any church bells in New York City. And if they do, you can't hear them above the noise of the traffic. All day and all night long, the cars and the trains and the buses, they never stop. The city is full of bright lights and constant noise and people are everywhere. You know, in New York City, life is very, very exciting. We three were gathered together in the small hours of the morning in a tall house overlooking an eerily empty square that boasted a half dozen trees and a number of carefully arranged stone benches. Earlier that same day, I'd flown into Rome via New York, and instead of going straight to Milan, and from there to Bellagio, where I was due to spend four weeks by myself writing, I decided that I'd once again like to see Venice, a city that I'd first visited 30 years earlier as a young man traveling across Europe in search of some sense of home. I wondered if the sublime somewhat haunting city that I'd encountered as a youth had retained her beguiling qualities? Or had the city now become detached from my emotions? Sometime in the late afternoon, my train lumbered across the slender, tantalizing causeway and came to a loud, screeching halt in Santa Lucia station. I was still a little jet lagged after the overnight flight, but I promptly stood up and I swung my bag down from the overhead rack and I set out in search of the small hotel that I'd booked. I'd chosen accommodation quite near to the train station and having left my bag in the postage stamp size room, I decided to take advantage of what daylight remained and thread my way down towards Piazza San Marco. However, being late March, the city was already bustling with tourists and no matter which way I turned or on what side of the narrow streets I chose to amble, I always felt as though I was walking into somewhat stubborn pedestrian traffic. I spent an hour wandering more contentedly in the open spaces surrounding the Basilica and the Doge's Palace. And then darkness began to fall rapidly and without any warning. I soon discovered a small tourist trap of a restaurant that looked, looked over at the island of San Giorgio, San Giorgio Maggiore and I ate a pizza that tasted of tomato smeared cardboard and I drank enough glasses of wine to render it thoroughly illogical that I'd not ordered a bottle. Having realized my error, I decided to switch to beer. Although the proprietor was beginning to clear up for the night, he allowed me to move outside 
into the brisk evening air and to sit on a metal chair at a table that having had its cloth removed now showed signs of considerable rust damage. Once situated, I downed one beer after another and tried to fight off the depression that was now beginning to overwhelm me. I found my mind drifting back 30 years to the journey I'd made at a time when I was able to think of myself as a young man whose future lay ahead of him. Back then, I had some hope for Europe and I was open to the notion that the continent was quite possibly standing on the edge of positive change. Now, having just flown in from New York City, I was trying to come to terms with the uncomfortable awareness that in some ways I no longer even felt a part of the continent. The progressive transformations I had yearned for had certainly not come to fruition. And the urgent questions that had informed a youthful journey were questions that no longer kept me awake at night. The truth was, three decades on, I was exhausted by my noisy, ongoing struggle with the word home. Eventually, I had to let the man close his restaurant, and so I asked for the bill. He offered me a knowing grin and passed me a small piece of paper with some handwritten numbers scrawled upon it. He then waved his hands in the direction of the small nest of beer bottles and indicated that they were on him, free. I mouthed a polite thank you, and then I scraped back my chair and decided that I wouldn't wait for any change from my 50 euro note. While he dragged another pile of chairs inside, I placed the ashtray on the note and slouched off along the quayside. Not yet ten at night, I turned away from the Canal de San Marco and started to tack my way along a vague trajectory that I somewhat optimistically believed might terminate at my hotel. But I understood that neither my mind nor my body were ready yet for sleep. Somewhere near Campo San Stefano, I fastened a zip on the front of my jacket in an attempt to smarten myself up a little. And then I opened the door into a small restaurant that had a bar area visible through the large front window. I took up a seat on a tall stool and I noticed the apprehensive owner exchange a surreptitious glance with his wife. I offered the man a quick nod of the head and watched as he visibly relaxed. He understood now. I was alone. I ordered a beer and the man placed both the bottle and a glass in front of me. And then he reached beneath the bar and produced a small dish of olives and a square white paper napkin. Grazie, I said, and he mumbled, prego. And at this point, my grasp of Italian stumbled, so I deemed it best to encourage no further eye contact. It had been like this 30 years ago. Night after night, eating by myself, with a paperback book or an out-of-date but nevertheless expensive English newspaper propped up in front of me. I soon became familiar with the stares that greeted the patron who asked for a table for one. In fact, it was always easier to eat and drink in bars where the idea of the solitary individual was somehow more acceptable. And I finally acknowledged that for this traveler, restaurants would always be slightly discomforting places. However, wherever I chose to eat, one thing was always clear. I had ample time to think about the questions that had inspired my peasant's pilgrimage 
across the breadth of the continent. Who was I? What was Europe? How, if at all, did I fit into this place? And now, 30 years had passed, but on a bar stool near Campo San Stefano, and very much against my will, I unexpectedly found myself beginning to once again toy, albeit half-heartedly, with these very same questions. I emptied the remains of my beer into the glass, but before I had a chance to ask for another Peroni, the, the owner proffered a fe fresh bottle and whisked away the empty one. Some two hours later, I was standing somewhat unsteadily in the shadow cast by a high wall and urinating into a canal. I was careful to direct my aim against a stone step, thus making sure that I didn't create a waterfall that splashed directly into the canal, for I had absolutely no desire to draw any unwanted attention to myself. I ambled back into the campo and I looked up at a church clock. Two things were undeniable. First, it was now late, well after midnight. And second, I was lost. I walked somewhat tentatively towards the dribbling fountain in the center of the square and wondered where on earth the pigeons had gone to. What time, I wondered, did they perform their final flutter and leave? And at what hour would the pigeons reappear in the morning? It was then that I saw the famous footballer sitting on the concrete lip of the pool that boasted the presence of the leaky fountain. A bright yellow baseball cap when the lid flipped backwards was already perched imperiously on top of his head. He complimented his headgear with expensive trainers whose laces were undone, designer sunglasses, large diamond studs that were clearly visible in each ear, and three heavy gold chains without medallions which were arranged casually around his neck. He looked at me over the top of his shades and ever so slightly raised his eyebrows. Lost, he asked. It was somewhat obvious that I was, so I didn't see any reason to immediately respond. He laughed. First time in the city? No, I said, but I can't say that I know the place. I'm trying to get back to my hotel. It's somewhere near the train station. I scrutinized the celebrity who looked to be fair, more like a rapper than a footballer. Mario Balotelli, right? He ignored my question and rose to his feet. And I was surprised to see just how tall and powerfully built he was. The vertical red and black stripes of his AC Milan shirt stood upright. Although, as I looked closer, I could see that his broad torso was stretching and curving the stripes away from the perpendicular. Come with me, he said. I want to take you to meet somebody. He's a good man, a friend of Sylvia's family. He paused. I should explain, he said. Sylvia is my mother. A long time ago, this man looked out for my mother and her family. And now this man looks out for me. A confident Mario led the way, and as we threaded our way through the tight alleyways and along dark back streets, we talked about his Jewish mother and her family and the city in which I lived. We seemed to be crossing many bridges, some improbably small and cramped, and I had to suppress a strange feeling that we might well be taking an over-elaborate and somewhat indirect journey. But I instinctively trusted the footballer, 
and was content to follow his lead. Occasionally a splash of lapping water or a glimpse of a scurrying cat dashing from one opening to another disturbed the night. But otherwise, aside from our two hushed voices, everything remained utterly calm and silent. At last, Mario led us over a final humpback bridge and into a broad open campo that was lined with a scattering of trees and stone benches. He stopped in front of a tall building and knocked on the door and we waited. I watched as my guide hitched up his designer jeans with one hand and then as Mario shaped to once again reach for the brass knocker, the door abruptly opened. A bright-eyed man with a shawl draped about his shoulders smiled and stepped to one side as though expecting both Mario and his guest. Mario had told me that the man that he was taking me to see was commonly known as the Elder. But the title was honorific. According to my new friend, the Elder was a leader of the community in this small, confined corner of Venice. And although there had been no election, and his power was more moral than political, Mario insisted that his authority was nonetheless real. Apparently, out of respect for his mother, Mario claimed that he made it his business to try and visit regularly with this man whose strange and sometimes mystifying manner he had over the years grown to respect. The elder was a small bird-like man and his piercing eyes were set deep in his heavily lined face like twin lumps of the blackest coal. We stood together in the hallway just inside the door and the elder held out a limp hand, which I took into my own. It soon became clear that I would be responsible for engineering the movement of a shake, which I did, although I was careful not to exert too much force. Mario spoke eagerly. He's on his way to Bellagio to write, but he's chosen to visit Venice once again after many years. And what is he looking for? asked the elder, who now cupped his hands in front of himself as though hiding something in the tiny cage between his palms. Mario shrugged his shoulders, I don't know. The old man returned his gaze now to me. Come, my friend, let's go sit by the fire and we can talk. The elder led the way along a drafty corridor and then through a small wooden door and into a cozy library room with an ominously low ceiling. On the furthest wall, a fire had been lit in the grate and two sofas sat facing each other with a small table between them. The elder gestured, please take a seat. He asked, do you drink coffee? I nodded, good, it will soon arrive. But please, you must rest yourself. You are welcome in my home. New York City. Mario's announcement that New York City was my home appeared to puzzle the elder, who continued to peruse my tired features. I felt ashamed that I was slightly tipsy in the presence of such an evidently wise and tranquil man. I also felt that I should probably apologize for having urinated in a canal in his city, although, of course, the elder had no way of knowing about my transgression. <laughs> Where are you really from? asked the elder. I hated this question. I spent my whole life running from everything that was implied when this question was, oh, so confidently dealt. Explain yourself, stranger. Justify your presence. 
Help us to understand you. Reduce yourself. The question was nearly always a gambit designed to make me feel inferior. But there was something gentle about both the voice and the manner with which the elder posed his question, and so I tried to relax. Mario leaned even further forward, and he began to speak with enthusiasm now. New York City, he said, is full of black people. Not just black Americans, but Africans and people from the Caribbean. You know, the city is different from how it is in the films. In the films, you don't see that many blacks, unless there's a crime that's being committed. In the films, most of the blacks are singers, or they play basketball or sport. But you know, when you go there, it isn't like that. The elder nodded slowly. He turned from Mario, and he studied me with a solemn intensity. Is this New York City really your home, he asked. And if so, do you feel safe there? Do you have a sense of belonging? Again, I was thrown back 30 years to my journey around Europe and the endless self-questioning and my attempt to discover constructive answers for both myself and Europe. It was a pilgrimage that ultimately found itself shipwrecked on the rocky shore of words and more words. And here I was, 30 years later, still in the business of producing circumspect words in an attempt to fortify myself against turbulence. But I said none of this, and Mario laughed. Of course he feels safe there. In New York City, the black man is free to be whatever he wants to be, even president. It's not like that here in Italy. It's different in his country. In America, they have to show him some respect. The elder nodded. Is that so? He continued to look directly at me. Is it true what Mario says about your New York City? If so, this must be a magical place. I'm trying to imagine a city where people are free to be whatever they wish to be. And I like the sound of this city. In fact, I would very much like to visit such a place. New York City, on the morning of September the 11th, 2001, 8.46 a.m., the first plane crashes into two World Trade Center. Safe? Really? September the 10th, 2001, was a good day to be a Muslim in New York City. September the 12th, 2001, was not such a good day. Mario, resplendent in his yellow hat, believes that the United States is a country that shows people respect. But this is not really my country, Mario. I told you this as we walked together to meet your friend. In 1984, I left Britain with its stink of fish and chips and prejudice and set out on a journey across Europe to see what I could find, perhaps a home. One afternoon, I discovered a place of refuge within a city where I assumed that people must fully understand that they cannot take safety for granted. My dear elder, your ironically pitched questions have struck their mark. I'm beginning to understand why I'm here again and not in Bellagio. In fact, my beer-induced stupor is fading away. One morning, the borders of your community were sealed, and instantly, you both belonged, and you were also a stranger. You and Mario's mother, Sylvia. Welcome to 1516. 
Without any cogent explanation, you are both of the place and not of the place. It's the European way. Please, please, may I pass by and just go about my daily business? Well, neighbor, do you not know me? And then later, in 1943, something else, right? You know, I feel curiously reinvigorated in this house with you and my naive friend, Mario. But I've been unkind because Mario is not naive. He's just quietly desperate to be rooted. And that's understandable. I understand. Britain, the West Indies, Africa. After 30 years, can I trust any of these places to recognize me and take me in? Well, Mr. Elder, you answer me that. Snow, sun and sand, slavery, the search for a singular identity, a place of simplicity and safety. I mean, really, who needs this cliched certitude in the 21st century? This is a century of fusion and confusion. So just what do you mean by asking me if New York City is my home? You mean to provoke me, don't you? And you've succeeded. But you don't have to play games with me, Mr. Elder. You and I have both seen the countless statues of itinerant moors that decorate this city. This is a city of supreme confusion, which is why you already know me. You've seen me before. But please speak to Sylvia's son, for Mario thinks that on every street corner in New York City, there's a hustler or a junkie who might one day grow up to be Barack Obama. Please steer him away from his romanticism. Mario, wake up, my friend, and smell the coffee, not the elder's coffee, which I've now drunk. You're already at home, Mario. And in this beguiling city, so am I. Look at me. I'm no longer a man drinking beer in a bar and then taking a piss into a canal and feeling guilty because he should be in Bellagio with his notepad open, ready to craft words and phrases of belonging and unbelonging. I'm once again an extravagant and wheeling stranger in a place which is familiar with strangers. Mr. Elder, I've been transported into your presence by Mr. Yellow Hat. And I'm now trying hard to imagine the awkwardly fraternal conversation that Shylock might have had with Othello. I'm also back, pushing back against the disturbing images of poor Sylvia's relatives being swept away on their miserable journey to Poland. And I'm trying hard to understand why Mario, the wandering footballer, thinks that the United States of America is the answer to anything when a million American Muslims and an unspeakable number of Native Americans can tell him that behind his style and fashion and his nicely affected hip hop bounce lies the ugly reality of that four legged word, home. You are welcome in my home. I look at the calm, satisfied face of the elder and wonder when exactly Venice became fused into my soul as the place in the world where these vexing questions of home are so powerfully resonant that tranquility can be produced and disrupted and then created again in the brief span of a single sentence. You are welcome in my home. 30 years ago, so long ago, and if so, just what have I been doing for these past three decades? In the early morning gloom, a still excited Mario led me the short distance from the elder's house to the Vaporetto stop 
where I thanked my famous friend. Ignoring the rotten stench of low tide, I took a deep breath and embraced Mario. And then through the melancholy mist, a boat emerged and we two parted. My intention was to stop briefly at the hotel in order that I might collect my bag and pay the bill and then make my way to the station and catch a train to Milan. A Canadian couple, the maple leaves on their backpacks were unmistakable, held hands and gazed in awe as we turned onto the Grand Canal. And I remembered a cardboard pizza, a bottle of Peroni and a dish of olives on the counter, a black-eyed smile that said, let me help you with your confusion. We sat in front of the roaring fire in the low-ceilinged room. I can admit it now. I live in a country that I don't belong to. September the 11th, 2001 taught me that. But did I listen? You, my favored blackamoor, you may marry Brabantio's daughter, but when we contemplate our strategic intervention into Cyprus and we no longer require boots on the ground, you will be on your own, pal. Meanwhile, I hear the fatigued voice of Shylock. How long am I supposed to wait for my 3,000 ducats? I mean, seriously, how long? Venice at dawn in the early morning fog. 1943, quick, all of you, prepare yourselves for a short train journey to Poland. 1516, stay where you are. Thank you, Mario. Indeed, I was lost. But you sat on the thick concrete lip of a fountain in your yellow hat and you spoke to me, and then you conveyed me to your friend, the elder. And on the way to Bellagio, the two of you made all the difference. Thank you. Where to start? <laughs> um, I remember the first time I went to America. Oh, sorry, I think you have um, uh, a microphone. Yeah, I remember the first time I went to uh, the United States of America in my mid twenties. Um, sort of believing in this idea of wanting to believe that there was a home for me in America and, um, and receiving almost sort of a benediction when I, I went, arrived at passport control and I handed in my US passport and, uh, and the security guard looked to me in my eye and said, welcome home. And, um, and, and, it, and America has this, I, I so wanted to believe in everything that America stood for. And um, I just wondered when you were Mario Balotelli's age, that was probably about the time that you decided to move to America. D did you imagine, did you buy into the American dream at any time? Yeah, I think, yes, yeah, I use this one. Um, I, I, first of all, I never decided to move to America. I went to America to teach for one year um, and then stayed a bit longer and then a bit longer and you know always had a place in London and was only teaching as I still do only half the year so to be honest I never really felt I still don't really feel maybe I'm delusional that I really live there because I get up every morning and I read the Guardian as you outed me I just want to know if Leeds won usually not um, <laughs> So all my concerns are 
British. I don't read the New York Times. I don't read the Washington Post. I don't watch CNN. So I think my sensibility, even after all these years of teaching generation after generation of American students, um, my sensibility and my concern is still totally focused here. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the question, the interesting question, Johnny, behind what you're saying is about believing in and the romance of America. I think in common with many people of, of my generation who grew up in Britain uh, in the 70s, you know, 60s, late 60s, 70s, starved of any sense of identity nourishment through literature or through culture um, that would reinforce who they are. You look to the United States of America, you know, you look to the United States of America to the Jackson Five, you look to the United States of America eventually for Richard Wright or James Baldwin or Langston Hughes, you look to the United States of America because you want to see yourself and that was the only mirror through which you could see yourself. Um, and Politically, of course, you look at Baraka, you look at Huey Newton, you look at George Jackson, Angela Davis. Um, it, it became the mirror through which you could see yourself because you couldn't see yourself uh, through the lens of, uh, you know, a British mirror. There was nothing coming back at you. Mercifully, um, that has changed uh, somewhat now. It's not perfect. But back then, I think I did have not so much a romance or a belief in America, but there was a necessity for America to exist in, in order to reinforce or uh, in some way endorse who you were. I remember one of your formative experiences at Oxford, um, an Oxford that certainly didn't um, reflect necessarily who, who, who you were. Uh, you fell under the spell of uh, an, an African-American academic. Uh, I forget his name now, but he introduced you to Richard Wright and, and, and suggested that you go to America. So how about, were you ever sort of tantalized by the, uh, the psychic geography of particularly New York, of the Harlem Renaissance, of, of Brooklyn? Teju Cole calls Brooklyn one of the world's great African cities. Uh, well, I, the, the, I mean, the, the, when I was a student, you know what, it, it's not really changed much. Statistically, th these so-called elite universities in Britain, like Oxford and Cambridge, they still discriminate against working class people and people from um, what they call the margins, the minorities, the diverse population, whatever um, nicely honed phrase you wish to use to describe the other, um, the percentage of people that were there when I was there was like hardly any, and it's now slightly less than hardly any. And there's a lot of agitation and a lot of um, disturb um, about this, as they should be. But I was very lucky because just at my college there happened to be, as you rightly say, an African-American Rhodes Scholar from Los Angeles, who's a bit of a white boy. Uh, he's a little bit, um, you know, I'd never met anybody who smoked dope before, for instance. Um, and, you know, in those days, Richard Pryor was just coming onto the scene, and he had Richard Pryor cassettes that he had sent over. And, and it was, for me, it was like a light bulb going off in my head. He, there was another way of being a black person, you know, which is basically, the guy's doing a PhD on Martin Luther King, but he's spliffing up and listening to Richard Pryor. It, it seemed to me entirely admirable, um, but I just didn't know how to get there. Um, and he, he, as you rightly say, is the person that said, looked at me and I'm not quite sure what he saw. I can guess what he probably saw, which he was lamentable. Um, but he said, you should, try and go to America and just travel around and just see other people like me and just, you know, so that's what I did in, in um, but I found America quite terrifying, I have to say. I, I found it very uh, liberating in some ways, but, you know, it's a, for a teenager, it's a hellishly big, confusing, turbulent country. You're traveling with not much money. It's the first time you've ever left Britain. Um, so it was liberating, but it would be false to say that 
you know, I got there and I, I, I thought, man, I really, one day I want to live here. I didn't feel that at all. The, the big discovery was literature. The big discovery was, was um, that it was possible for a, um, a black person to write a book. Something that they'd not actually mentioned at Oxford. So I had to go to America to figure out that that was possible. I'm just quite interested with how you sort out figures that could help you make sense of blackness. Um, I know that you s used to send letters to Linton Kwesi Johnson, for instance. <laughs> letters he never replied to. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I just wonder if Linton would think the same way as you in terms of like, it seems to me that Linton's uh, journey is very much rooted in a black Britishness. And I suppose, you know, growing up, I just wondered if you could talk about growing up in the north of the north of England and the, and the sort of the challenges and, and, and the, posit the positives of, of growing up sort of on the periphery of blackness. Well, let me just say something about Linton first, because, you know, he's a, he is and has been for you know, 40 years, you know, the guy I consider the writer I respect the most and a dear, close, close, close friend. I, I respect him enormously because he articulated the concerns of my generation before anybody did. And he articulated it without any apology and without any of that rather um, unfortunate self-aggrandizing that sometimes comes, that we sometimes discover in the literary world, what we would call today the world of celebrity. Uh, he shunned that and kept his eye completely focused on the literary and the political nature of his quest. And, and you know, of course, he did respond and we did meet often and we have, you know, pretty much the same conversation for the last... <laughs> <laughs> however many decades, but... Um, what, what is that conversation? The conversation is... Um, the conversation is about... I mean, it sounds too grand to say the state of the nation, but it is about how to exist in Britain, how to write in Britain, how to... Uh, how to navigate the politics. Actually, we talk quite often now in public on both sides of the Atlantic, you know, in New York and in New Haven and in Paris. We've done this so many times, but it's, it's a conversation about literature and it's a conversation about politics and it's a conversation about growing up and the path to growing up and it's a conversation about generation and what this particular generation today don't understand about a certain journey. So it's a basically an old geezer's conversation at this stage. Um, but it's a conversation which I've, I've valued for, you know, two thirds of my life. I've been lucky um, to have such a person as a friend. I also think that growing up in the north of England is very different from growing up in London. Um, you know that because you're, you're, you're from Yorkshire too. You know, it's... It's like a double whammy in a sense because there's a there's a, a, a geographical dislocation from the center, and after all, in the 50s and the 60s, British working class writers, uh, white working class writers like David Story or Alan Silito or Keith Waterhouse, there's any number of novels you know that end with somebody with a one-way ticket to London on a train platform in Leeds or Bradford or Sheffield trying to get the hell out of there. Um, to quest their way to the literary center. So there's that geographical dislo dislocation. There's a class dislocation as well, because as we know, the north of England, the industrial heart of England is largely working class. Um, and you generally only discover that what, what that means really when you move south. And then obviously again, there's race, um, you know, because uh, class and race go together. They're like, you know, Tom and Jerry, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. You try and uncouple them, you're diluting the discussion to the point where it begins to make no sense. So I think all of these things factored into 
my upbringing and what I subsequently wanted to try to write. I mean, it's, it's one thing to uh, to be from the industrial north and, and head to London like I did and, and be shocked to find out that you are working class and northern. Suddenly, you know, that becomes, some, uh, becomes very apparent. But then it's another thing to that when your first experience is not just the south, but the centre of privilege, Oxford. Um. Yeah, I, you see, there was a, I read a piece not so long ago by Alan Bennett, you know, who's from Leeds too, uh, and in which he said something that I completely agreed with. He said, all the time I was at Oxford, I'd wander around and look at these buildings, and I would always feel that I was just not a part of this. Um, I could enter them, but I would never belong. And uh, that's exactly how I felt. I still feel that way when I'm there. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. Um, I never felt any sense of wanting to belong to anything, and certainly not something where I was going to be that most difficult, um, yet familiar figure, the only one in the room. I'm kind of fed up of being the only one in the room. So, uh, I'm not today, but uh, it's, you know, that's why I, don't, I just don't feel comfortable there. And I don't really, you know, I don't have any regret or any, there's no palpable discord. It's just, you go there and you're there for a reason. It's like most things, you have to figure out. I mean, I tell my students at Yale this, I tell them, listen, you are not just like the luckiest 1% in this country. You're the luckiest 0.001%. You need to figure out why you're here. You need to figure out what you want to take away from this place. You need to be a pirate. Figure out what you take. Don't wander around thinking it's going to give you anything. It's not going to give you anything except a headache. Figure out what you want to leave with. Not the degree, because you definitely want to leave with that. But what do you want to take away? Um, and I think that's how I felt being a, a student. I just thought, I'm not going to let this place grind me down. I'm not going to change my accent. I'm not going to, you know... My mother said to me when I went to university at 18, because you know, nobody in my family had been to university, she said, shall I make you a cape? I, I, I was like, what? <laughs> you know? I mean, I was kind of as speechless as I am now. You know, I'm like, what, where do you think I'm going? You know, what do you think these people do? But she, was, she didn't know either. She just thought that everybody wore a cape, you know? Um, <laughs> So, there was going to be no, there was, you just sort of fumble your way through, it's like writing a book. You just, you don't know what you're doing most of the time, you're just fumbling in the dark, but you've just got to keep going. You've just got to keep quarrying and keep believing and believing that at the end of this period of time, um, you will take something from the amount of hours that you've put in. You mentioned uh, fumbling, and it takes me back to this quote um, from Mo's Def that I used earlier on that I'm sort of obsessed with. Uh, he's got this lyric that says, um, to, he's talking about the Great North Migration, to navigate the treacherous and make it seem effortless, like those who made the exodus seeking the North Beacon. And, and I always tie that quote into um, an idea that Robert Farris Thompson had. Um, who I believe actually coined the term Black Atlantic. I believe he was the first person to coin it. I don't know if that's right. But, um, and and he traces, he's got this idea of the aesthetic of the cool. And the, he traces, I think it, it's back to uh, ancient Liberia, of, of, and he traces it through to Afro-Cuban jazz, uh, the poise of uh, the leaders of the civil rights movement, of a, a black mask of cool to wear... Uh, in, in unsteady times uh, to keep your balance. It, 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 you strike me, your, your, your prose and uh, the way you present your work and as a person, as somebody who's, who's, who has a certain stillness, is this sort of a, a, a mask that you put on or is it something that you've cultivated or, or were you born like that? <laughs> uh, well, I definitely wasn't born like that. Um, you know... 
I wasn't I wasn't born like that because you know I was a you know I was a young hooligan. I was a um, I was a you know troublemaker at school. I was always in trouble. I was always causing trouble. Um, you know, acting out. Um, but the 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 you can't write from a position, you can't write effectively from a position of anger. You know, it's my, my job is to understand people. That's my job, is to try and empathize and try and understand. So that involves a certain quietitude, that involves thinking. Um, if I was a political activist or if I was more socially engaged in the world, you know, then I, I think, I think I have more than enough capacity to have my blood pressure rise. Um, uh, in, in any number of situations, and it does, of course, you know, the things you read, things you see, um, Grenfell Tower, Trayvon Martin, you know, you get deeply upset and deeply disturbed. But in order to write about that, there has to be a period of reflection and there has to be a period of, of as I say, the same word, quietitude, where you're, you're trying to process and you're trying to understand. So, um, and I think that's true for most creative people, to be honest. I, mean, I think you're trying, to, you're trying to make something. If you're a painter or a musician or a, um, a sculptor, or a writer, you're in the business of making something where nothing existed before. And you're not in the business of taking stuff apart. You're not in the, you know, you're not in the deconstruction or demolition business, which is often a little noisy. You're trying to put something together quietly. Um, so I think it's, I'm not suggesting for one minute that, I, that I, I can't behave irrationally and I can't, which I do, and I can't um, get upset over things, which I do. Um, but not when I'm working. No. I, just, I know that you, you don't do social media, um, but I just wonder if, as with your students, if you ever feel like you have to help them navigate this world of social media and if you have advice for them or about doing deep work in this era where your attention I don't, is constantly... I don't, I don't even know what social media is. <laughs> you know, I have a flip phone, as you know. I mean, me and Steve Jobs parted company in about 1997. So I never made it to the smartphone. Um, I, I, I don't do Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitter, anything like that. It's a generational thing. So I would be a terrible person to help them navigate anything <laughs> like that because I don't, I don't do it. What, what perhaps is be, behind your question is that I think that a lot of this stuff, um, this connectivity, is uh, antithetical to empathizing because so much of it is judgmental. Um, and my job as a writer is not about passing judgment all the time. It's about trying to understand. So social media is, generally speaking, opinions or a, a certain opinion in a certain number of characters, which leads me to the second problem I have with social media, which is a denigration of the language. Um, because, again, the job of a writer is to dignify the language. The language is what you have to work with. Um, how the hell we got from the dignity of the language of Obama to Trump's tweets? in one year, it's the language that tells you more about what's happening than the policies. Because the language, the English language, or whatever language you're using, contains nuances which suggest 
a generosity and an openness to understanding the full complexity of what it means to be a human being. If you think you can only respond on Twitter, that tells you something about what you think about human complexity. I've been having, um, I've sort of identified a connection recently, um, and I don't know if you'd agree with it, but I've been speaking to people who were born in countries that no longer exist, um, notably Yugoslavia and, and, and uh, East Germany. And I find that there's an incredible, uh, we have incredible, we have lots of things to talk about. There's a connection between these people who grew up in, or were born in countries that no longer exist and, and the sort of black experience. And, and something, a theme that always comes up is, um, is something that can sustain us, that, that goes beyond the nation state. I'm thinking of the rise of nationalism at the moment as well. And, and something that maybe could anchor us, but, but that is something more imaginative, and like I say, goes beyond the nation state. And I wonder if you have anything like that uh, for you, something, uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned this notion of home. Uh, maybe it's naive to think of a home exactly, but do you have anything that, that makes you feel like you're on solid ground? Or do you think that's even something that should be looked for? Well, you know, the, I mean, the best, the only response I have really to that is, is, is what, um, what Derek Walcott said, you know, which is no nation, only the imagination. That's where I feel on solid ground, is the imagination. Uh, I'm not trying to make a case for the lack of importance of nationhood because I think it's very astute to point to what happens when a country ceases to exist. Um, or what happens when a country ceases to exist for a certain length of time and then re-emerges, like Poland did, for instance. Um, nation states and boundaries are important. But for me, more important than the nation is the imagination, because that transcends nations. And that's what connects us all, whether we're, you know, Latvian, French, Dutch, Spanish, Italian, Venezuela, I mean, is an engagement as both as practitioners and as readers is the imagination, and it's, that's the bridges and, that have been built, and those the tunnels that have been dug that, you know, um, keep us together, or as, you know, the great epigraph that E.M. Forster used, you know, only connect, you know. I think that's true, only connect. That's what we should be doing, just, that's what, you, I, you know, your lovely, terrific um, conference is doing. It's trying to, it's trying to follow in a tradition that E.M. Forster figured out a hundred years ago, only connect, make connections. I'm thinking of, of something else. I've um, got an architectural review from 1987, and I think it might be the last interview that James Baldwin ever did. I can't be sure about that, but um, and it was all about um, his home in Saint Paul de Vence. It was kind of a lifestyle piece. And I don't know if you've, you're familiar with this. And there's a quote in there that I'll never forget. It said that when um, the beginning of my life somewhat resembles a shipwreck. And the shipwrecked can find it difficult to trust daylight or dry land. Um, and I just wonder, you were somebody who, who visited James Baldwin um, at this place in St. Paul de Vence, um, this place that sounds idyllic. But I just wonder, you know, you know, as somebody who'd grappled with notions of of home, belonging, and identity, uh, where where it had taken him towards the, the, the end of his life. Well, it was an idyllic setting, but trust me, it was a chaotic household. I mean, I spent a lot of time um, uh, over the last few years of Jimmy's life in Saint Paul de Vence with him. Um, it was a kind of home, but it wasn't his home, um, which is, I mean, the last time I was there was the day after he died and I was talking to his brother, and it was clear that 
he was going to be buried in New York. You know, after all this time in France, it was clear that he, they had to get the coffin and the body, which was in the hallway, lying there, to New York. Um, they were not going to put him in um, France, even though France respected him. So Saint Paul de France was a place to get away from the turbulence of his life as a celebrity. I mean, it's an impossible place to write from, center stage with the lights on you. And for a lot of the 1950s and certainly into the 1960s, he was probably the most famous writer in America. Um, and he had to find a place where he could hide, where he could remain sane, and at a certain point, literally. So it was a kind of home. Um, and even as I'm saying that, I think I wrote a radio play about him called A Kind of Home, because it was a kind of home, friends. Um, but in the same way that Derek spent all those years in America, and Seamus Heaney, too, spent all those years in America, and Joseph Brodsky spent all those years in America, they were never going to be buried in America. And none of them are buried in America, because it was... America was a kind of home for them. So it's, you know, Baldwin's France was incredibly important to him. His Saint Paul de Vence house was beautiful and completely bonkers in its day to day running. Um, but it was a really seductive place to be because you were talking to an elder who I respected greatly and learned a tremendous amount from. Um, but I, I knew, I, I knew as, as well as he did, that um, this was not it. This was just where you had to be to keep your mind and body together. America's a tough place to write in, as many Americans have discovered. Do you think America is an easier place to write in for somebody who's not from America? I'm just thinking of that exchange because, like James Baldwin, my father, uh, African American expat who um, was treated really well in the UK, and and I almost find it. And I think we've talked about this before. In America, when you're not part of the um, the shared history. I feel like as soon as I speak with an English accent, I'm treated better in America. You know, is moving to America a way to escape the noise of the place where you know you are part of the problem. You mean for, for me, you live in America? Yes, for you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, well, it was, at the time when I went to live in America, I'd been living in Sweden the year before. I'd been teaching at the University of Stockholm. And, you know, although I could have stayed there and carried on, it, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Stockholm in January, <laughs> but that's just not happening. It's just, so, I knew I wasn't going to stay there, so I went back to St. Kitts. I was actually living in St. Kitts at the time, um, between St. Kitts and London. And I liked the idea of going to America for a year for two reasons. One, although I'd visited America quite a number of times, I'd been fortunate enough to have people send me there to do various things. Um, I didn't really feel that I had a sustained understanding of the country. So I thought, if you're going there to have the opportunity to work with young people, work with students, for a year would give me an opportunity to sort of know America in a more intimate way. So that appealed to me. Um, but the other aspect of it was, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I was a bit fed up with every time a black guy threw a bottle at a policeman, I would get a call from a newspaper or the BBC asking me what I thought of it. And I didn't have it, I, I, that's not my job, you know, is to like tell you why this is, I didn't want to be like the interpreter. First of all, it's not my job. And secondly, there are people, other people better qualified to do this. So it was a way of escaping that for a while too. You know, you, you can sometimes be cast in the role like one of my friends said to me when I was a student, you know, he said, 
you know, I really wish you could talk to my dad because hey, my dad's really racist, but if he talked to you, then I think you could, I'm thinking, that's not my job to talk to your dad. Why don't you talk to your dad? <laughs> you know, um, but that was a, a sort of bigger version of this that I was finding was happening. You know, people were expecting me to explain why there was an, you know, why the natives were behaving badly on Ladbroke Grove during carnival again. Well, they were pissed, you know, <laughs> you know. It was hot and they were drinking a lot and what's the problem, you know? So, but that was, the answer wasn't the problem. I was just fed up with the questions. So, yes, there definitely was an element of, of, of learning about America, but there's also an element of just, um, just go away somewhere for a while and just get on with your work. And, and any any plans to, to return to the UK? You know, do you think you'll... Uh, I've been um, Tuesday. I, was, I taught there this year. I taught at the University of East Anglia. I'm going to be teaching at St Andrews next spring. So I'm there. Well, you know this, so don't give me your bogus questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm there. I'm there quite frequently. <laughs> Doing this, that, and the. <laughs> um, as for returning permanent, who knows? You know, you, you never know the, the trajectory of your life. You, you just don't know what, what will happen. Um, so, I don't know. Um, you don't know if you've still got any. You know, who knows? Listen, I like, as I said to you, um, it's important. It matters to me. I grew up in England and I grew up in Europe. So it matters to me that no kid goes through what I went through. Um, America, I didn't grow up there. I didn't learn to read there. I didn't learn to write there. What do I care? You know, I want to do a decent job as a teacher. Um, but I don't want any kid to go through what I went through in Britain or in Europe. So I have to be engaged in some way. Otherwise, what have I done? Sort of drawn up the ladder after me and just buggered off. That's no use to anybody, really, is it? It's, I mean, it's astonishing, though, how, uh, like, you know, reading the European tribe again, how prescient it was and, and how actually, you, you know, you said you've been offered uh, uh, deals to write the European tribe again, but, but you sort of... You've resisted it because... Uh, nothing's changed and when you read the sort of the end of the European tribe it's it's astonishing that it could have been written to yesterday um. well I haven't read it again but I believe you um, <laughs> but uh, um, you know things have changed of course superficially things have changed superficially things have changed but one of the things you learn very quickly I guess um, as you press on, uh, is change happens slowly. You know, it, it doesn't happen in one generation or two generations, and it certainly doesn't happen as a result of legislation. Certain important things do happen as a result of legislation, but you cannot legislate the human heart. You can't legislate against... Um, you, you can tell people it's illegal to do certain things, but that doesn't mean that they still don't have the impulse to do them and they still won't find a way to do them. So things have changed and people are more aware of certain things. But the fundamental dynamic of belonging and not belonging um, is still at the heart of Europe, is still plaguing this continent. And in some respects, when I do read the news and um, watch uh, the TV news, it's... It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see how little has changed. Due to time, I think this might be a really good opportunity to throw to the, uh, the audience. Do we have any questions? Okay. Is there somebody who can, uh, who can go around with a microphone? <laughs> I think one's coming. Um, just very briefly, you wrote the screenplay for Mystic Masseur, uh, a novel by V.S. Naipaul, 
Um, it's the only one of his that was filmed. How were you drawn into that? And did you have, did you enjoy the experience? And now with his passing, what do you think his legacy would be for black writing, which I think he would not have <laughs> assumed he was ever part? No. Well, um, I did the film for, for this reason. The normal writer for Merchant Ivory Pictures is a woman called Ruth Prova Javala, um, who writes all of their movies. Now, she was a friend of mine. When Ismail Merchant got it into his head that he wanted to do this film, she said, you should get Kaz to write it because it's so out of my experience writing about the Caribbean. And Ismail knew I'd written films, so he approached me and said, would you like to write a, a screenplay for Merchant Ivory Pictures? And, you know, I, I loved Howard's End. I liked what they did with The Remains of the Day, etc. So I met him in a London hotel, wondering what it was he wanted me to write. And he said, it's V.S. Naipaul's The Mystic Masseur. And I thought, huh. Um, because I knew Naipaul was not, um, I'd written something about him that I knew he didn't like. Um, I thought it was okay. But um, I'd been critical about something. So I knew that he didn't like me. But So I told Ismail, I'm not so sure that... And he said, well, I have, I, I have the rights. So it's not up to Vidya and I, Paul. If you want to do it, we'll do it. So I wanted to work with Jim Ivory and Ismail Merchant because I admired them and I was, uh, and I liked the book. So that's why I did it. Um, and I know that Naipaul didn't like the film. Actually, uh, yeah, I'm, we're not going to get into it, but it's not as good a film as it could have been for many reasons. Um, what do I think of Naipaul? Well, you know, I, I sort of, when he died, I got lots of requests from the BBC, The Guardian, The New York Times, The New York Review of Books to write about him. And I said no to everything because I felt I'd already written enough about him. Um, and I'd actually written positively about him too when he won the Nobel Prize. Much to my surprise, I wrote positively about him because I just felt, you know, um, there is an achievement there that it would be churlish not to um, acknowledge. But I didn't want to have to write in the wake of his passing because I didn't feel, him, I didn't feel compelled to write. So um, his legacy, no writer knows what their legacy is going to be. Nobody knows. Nobody has a clue. Um, the, history is littered with the evidence of so many writers who have died in deep obscurity who are now central to the canon. And so many writers who have died who have had countless column inches dedicated to their passing who we just don't know who they are now. So we can't guess what the, that legacy is going to be. Um, in his case, there will be some kind of legacy because it's it's not just English literature, it's a narrow corner of English literature that we have to look at him through as well. Whether you call it post-coloniality, whether you call it Caribbean literature. So there will be a legacy, but I, I don't know what that will be. I just don't know. Any other questions? Oh, we have a question here. Uh, thanks for sharing your short story with us. And um, Leeds United are doing quite well, actually, in the championship right now. I just right need now. to know if they won today. Okay. They played Blackburn, and I'm still trying to find out, because I only have a flip yeah. phone, if they beat Blackburn. <laughs> but you talk, you, t you, you clearly, you're lecturing, and you're around the young a lot. And um, I did a little bit of lecturing, and I look at the younger... When we were growing up, our parents, our grandparents said, you've got to be twice as good as white people to get along. I, um, they should have said, you could be twice as good as them and you still might not get along. But anyway, they gave us that good warning that it's going to be tough, it's going to be really tough. And I look at 
some of the young people or some of the young people I'm sitting down there in front of me and they don't seem to understand the seriousness of the situation in how tough it is now. You could argue it's even worse now. We had the 80s when we had the positive action policies, at least in London and some left-wing councils, whatever. You had a generation who came through. So I do you worry that the young students of colour basically don't realise how serious the situation is and what can we older people tell them to, to help them maybe see? I d yeah, okay. Mm. Uh, well, thank you. It's a good question. The, the short answer is, yeah, I do worry. To be honest, I do worry. Uh, what can you do? Well, you can be in the room with them um, because that's the evidence of something. And you can try to encourage them to read. Um, you have to read. Uh, you need to know history. Uh, you need to know the journey. And not just the kind of cheesy, easily packaged Windrush narrative. That doesn't tell you everything. The, the journey is uh, and the history of their presence in Europe is far more complicated than 492 Jamaicans got off a ship in 1948. Um, I see Bernardine somewhere back there who knows about Roman history and the presence, the black presence. They need to know um, whatever walking tour Johnny's going to be doing tomorrow morning, people in Belgium need to know. It's complicated and it's inextricably tied up with the wider history of Europe. So how do they find out about that? Partly through your being in the room with them, but reading. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, I do worry because it's easy to assume you've arrived somewhere. And it was partly what I read was about vigilance. You know, the story of the Jewish presence in Europe is about vigilance and the necessity for vigilance. It's tired, it's tiring, you know, to be vigilant, to have to always look over your shoulder and think. But that's better than what the alternative is. I had a question actually, I'm, I'm just thinking we're here in Belgium and uh, I was thinking of the, the book by Adam Hochschild, King's Leopold, King Leopold's Ghost and, and, and at the end Adam Hochschild mentions how difficult it was to get lead actors who were African in that story because uh, the, the voice of the colonisers is, is always documented to history more than the colonised and the subjugated. And he said that if, if we're to enter into the, the minds of Africans during that time, it may well be that we have to do it through fiction, um, like Chinua Achebe, and, 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 and you certainly do. Is, is that, you know, I was thinking of your, your talk today, which blurred that line between fact and fiction. Are you, are you conscious of, 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 of inserting these missing narratives into history, or, or is that, or do you just wait for that to come to you? Do, you know, where, where does that come from? Well, uh, you know, if you, if, if you, well, the short answer, John, is yeah, I am conscious um, of, of, of it, certainly once the process is underway. But again, if you grow up in a country that doesn't recognize you, that looks at you and doesn't know who you are or what you are, then you have to write yourself into visibility. Um, that's just part and parcel of what you have to do. And that's what those colonial writers that were, I've been mentioning, um, Walcott, Achebe, Naipaul, um, Lamin, Salvon, Shoyink, uh, that, that's what they did. They had to write themselves into visibility as colonial voyages, however temporary, to the center. Um, but just because you're second or third generation doesn't mean you still don't have to write yourself into visibility. 
because they don't, they still, the teachers still don't know what they're looking at when they see a black kid in the class uh, or a mixed race kid in the class. There's still an impulse to see a problem, something that's not categorizable. Um, or when they see somebody of a different religion. They don't know. So if you're writing, there is going to be a tendency, I think, to want to address these, um, these gaps of understanding and uh, looking at history and giving voice to people who haven't had a chance to have a voice, um, whose narratives are as important um, as that of the dominant class or the dominant group is just part, of, I think, of, of the legacy of how you grow up, you know. Some of my friends, and I, and I have written about this, some of my good friends, writers, British writers, English, white British writers, don't have to give a second thought to this because they, the visibility is assumed. You know, it's what I call the Woody Allen syndrome. You know, you make films set in New York City and there's no black people because he doesn't see them. He doesn't have to think about that because his presence, um, and he's not the only one, his presence and his vision is assumed to be the dominant vision, but it doesn't square with what you would actually see if you opened your eyes. So the onus then falls upon other people, including some black filmmakers, to counter that, um, to be aware of that, to be cognizant of that. Some people have the luxury of not actually having to see and still appear to make a good career out of it. Um, the moral responsibility, I think, on the shoulders of a first or second or third generation writer coming out of the African diaspora and world uh, is to see, to see. Um, because you can't write if you can't see, but you certainly can't write from that position if you're not seeing clearly. Yeah, I remember James Baldwin saying something about, um, uh, you give me an advantage because you never had to look at me, but, but I've always been looking at you, you know. Um, is there any, are there any more questions? Oh, I, th I think we're out of time actually. Yeah, we're out of time, okay. Um, okay, yeah, okay, one more quick, quick question then. <laughs> Um, hi, um, I just want to ask about the it's too loud, sorry, about the voice uh, of you know this expectation of as a novelist uh, you know being expected to represent so-called oppressed community, and I just want to know how whether this weighs down on your imagination and whether this uh, you living to the United States, for example, and the distance has uh, liberated you in a way. Thanks. Well, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, the answer is absolutely not. Nothing has ever weighed down on my imagination. Um, I don't feel any obligation to represent anybody or any group. Um, I feel an obligation to represent my own vision of things. It may have been, you know, I've never, Nobody has ever suggested an idea to me about a book. I've never listened to any publisher, full stop. Uh, but I've never listened to a publisher who's ever said, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea if you... The only one time, actually, once, that a publisher said, I don't think you should do this book, was the European tribe. That was the only time. Um, and I said, I will leave the publishing house then. Um, and then there was no more conversation, but a smaller advance. Um, so the, I have never felt a pressure, to be honest. I think I'm quite a stubborn character. I've never felt a pressure to represent or to follow the guidelines of a publisher or an editor or chase a market or anything. Um, now, being in the United States of America, I think there is a lot of pressure on writers in America to chase the market and to represent. I think it's actually um, perhaps an even more moronic industry publishing in America than it is in Europe um, because they are so market-driven. Um, 
that I, you know, the writers that I know in America are working so assiduously hard to commission for certain topics that pop up in the news and you're expected to produce something in response. So I don't think being in America frees you from anything. I think it's just to do with your own particular stubborn mindset. I've been very fortunate, I will say, there's always a certain amount of luck that nobody ever wants to talk about luck. But in any career, in any, um, in any avenue, luck always, just good fortune plays a, a part in it as well. And I had for over 20 years a terrific editor in New York, uh, a man from uh, India called Sonny Mehta, who was the head of Knopf, and he had my back for a long time when my sales figures did not look like they justified continuing. So I was very lucky in that sense. And I had a similar relationship with a publisher in Britain too. So there, I've been lucky that I haven't had to, but I, that, that's, not, um, that's not out of any, necessarily out of any sense of inherent talent or ability. There is always an element of, you know, you need a fellow traveler or just the good luck to have met somebody who will guide and help you and support you. Okay, I, th I think we're going to have to wrap up there. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break, but I'd like uh, you to thank somebody that has certainly... I've had the good fortune of somebody who's guided and supported me uh, throughout my career. Um, I'd like you to put your hands together, please, for Carol Phillips. Thank you.